Okay, welcome to a new episode of AlphaCast. Today we have an exciting show focused around gardening and permaculture. So if you're into gardening or, or lurk, looking to learn more about growing your own food, this is the show for you. Today we have a special guest, uh, AV's own resident master gardener and permaculture expert, Deb Lando. How are you doing today, Deb? Doing great. Thank you. Well, we are super excited to have you on the show today. Um, just a little update on um, those who aren't familiar with Deb. Um, she is the, one of the co-founders of Alpha Vedic, and like I said, our resident master gardener. She is in charge of the Alpha Vedic Botanic Gardens. Uh, she's got a, an impressive resume uh, in this field as uh, the owner of uh, of Garden State Nursery in Carpinteria, California. Uh, she was the owner of Lost Coast Nursery and Farm Supply in the Lost Coast in Humboldt County, California. And as we said now, the current uh, owner designer of Alphabetic Gardens, which is up here on the Smith River in Del Norte County. She's a certified master gardener and permaculture in permaculture with Oregon State University. Uh, she's been a garden co uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a columnist for the triplicate in Crescent City and the Curry Coastal Pilot in Brookings, Oregon, uh, and is also a public speaker and teacher of gardening classes here in Del Norte County and Curry County. She's very passionate about permaculture and using that to help uh, her community and has been recently involved with the Sea to Supper program here in Curry County and Crescent City, which was created by the Oregon Food Bank with uh, Oregon State Master Gardeners as teachers. She, like I said, she studied permaculture design with Oregon State and is married to Dr. Lando. So we are going to have a wonderful conversation today and dive deep into all things gardening. I'm excited about this. Um, as a somebody who owns some property and is trying to walk the talk myself with my own garden, um, this is going to be a good show for me as well because I'm more of a brown thumb, if you will. Well, not a brown, I'd say a yellow thumb, uh, not quite green yet, and probably more just because I haven't had the time to devote to my practice. But as our subject matter, subject line for today states, we are going to dive into the internal arts of developing your green thumb and getting more connected with your garden and um, what that all entails. Uh, does that sound about right, Deb? It's kind of an internal practice in a way? It is. As my mother used to say, it's an inside job. And she was an avid gardener, as were my grandparents and my great-grandparents. Wonderful. And get, let's get a little background on you so um, folks out there okay. can kind of understand where you came from. If you'd like to give us just a little bit of where you, um, where you grew up and kind of what was your journey that led you down this path towards um, uh, your current evolution as uh, somebody who's getting their hands in the dirt every day. Well, my family is um, one of the original pioneer families that came to Northern California in the 1800s. And we had a cattle ranch on the coast of, um, in Marin County on the coast. We had several thousand acres there. And I was very fortunate because at one point, my great grandparents, my grandparents and my parents were all alive and living together on the land and that is where I was actually originally taught the basics of gardening. Of course, it was weeding and shelling peas and eating raspberries and blackberries on the property. But you, it, was always, it was always something to do. Hands were always in the soil because people did not go to the, you know, it wasn't convenient even in the early 50s to just run to the store and grab whatever you wanted. So, you know, cooking and growing your own food was just a basic part of life, as I think it was in a lot of America still at that time. You mean you didn't have Uber Eats back then? <laughs> no, I didn't have Uber Eats. There were no microwaves. Everything was done uh, in the home. And that, that generational um, passing down of knowledge and the skills of gardening were just something that everyone did, even in the, in 
the whole nation, even in um, some of the urban areas. If you didn't live rurally, even the urban areas had gardens, vegetable gardens every, every season. And it was part of our life in America. And when I began to get into the nursery industry, um, then it became, I was really alerted by the late 1990s. I had a lot of young women that would come into my nursery and say, I have a black thumb. I don't know how to grow anything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's so discouraging for me. And then I, would, I began to question them and I'd say, well, did you ever learn anything from your grandmother, your mother? And at that point, women had gone into the workplace. We had a, the families had started to disintegrate and there were a lot of single family parenting going on, parents and single family parent parenting and the kids were raising themselves at home uh, when the mom was at work. And so that, that uh, thread of wisdom was, began to get severed in our nation. And now, now we're seeing really uh, very, a lot of disconnect that way for people. They just don't, they don't have a clue on what to do at all with living things. Yeah, that's fascinating. And so apropos for um, what Alpha Vedic's all about, really, is getting reconnected with uh, nature uh, and just natural law, which is something we discuss so much on this show. And that really is, um, you just kind of hit the nail on the head there with, um, in the past, it was this was knowledge that was handed down from grandmother to mother, grandfather to father, uh, it was just uh, common, really a common knowledge uh, growing up, learning, you know, knowing how to grow your own food. Uh, and this is something that is quite alarming uh, in, in the general trends of society is this disconnect. So something definitely we'll dive into uh, today and give folks that are listening to this, watching this, some insights on how they can get reconnected. Uh, some some basic things to get started in the garden, I think, would be good, and then some more um, advanced techniques, of course, uh, in regards to ensuring that you have a thriving garden. And this will go off on, uh, I'm sure, a number of tangents. So, as you started getting into the nursery game, um, I guess it'd be good to get a little insight on to kind of where that took you. How did you get into permaculture? Maybe we can. Um, Kind of dive a little bit into what permaculture is and how that relates to what we're currently doing at Alpha Vedic Botanic Gardens. Well, I've had a varied um, career life, if you will, but always very health oriented. Um, I taught exercise classes, I used to run distance. Uh, my husband and I, when we got together, we did a lot of we were always working out, uh, taking care of ourselves. And he also, too, came from a ranching family in Marin County. So our lifestyle from the time we were, you know, kids, young kids, was just an outside life. It's just what you did. You didn't have to worry about uh, anything happening. Your parents used to say, well, come, don't come back till dinner time. That's what mm -hmm. most kids of the 50s heard. And it was great because we just, uh, we explored nature. We lived in a really rich area uh, in terms of um, just the beauty of it and the coast, the redwoods, the uh, hills to explore, uh, clean water. And it was very uncrowded at the time. Now the now Marin County and the San Francisco Bay Area is just you know, 10 lanes of freeway. But when we were growing up, it was just small little hamlets, little towns. And being health oriented, and when my husband went into the health field and realized that there was a bigger picture, just because we'd had a life of um, feeling balanced mm -hmm. and knowing how great the body can feel when you're eating well and you're you're moving your body and you're working out and just taking care of it, we began to see, um, well, first of all, we moved to, we left the mainland, we left Marin County and moved to Hawaii. We took our boys to Maui. 
And there, as always, I was a home gardener, but there I learned, um, I was in a semi-tropical environment, so I learned gardening from in the semi-tropical climate. That was wonderful. We were there about 14 years came back. And when we moved back, we ended up in Southern California in the Santa Barbara area. And the boys wanted to go to college there because they were surfers. So they wanted to continue to surf. And at that point, my husband didn't need me any longer in his practice. Now we had a residential healing center on Maui. We had a global clientele. So we've had a lot of um, different people influence our lives. But when we came back to the mainland, um, I there was a gal who had a little nursery downtown and unbeknownst to me, the foothills of Southern California from Paso Robles, the San Luis Obispo area, all the way down to Ventura Oxnard is, was filled with generational growers because of the climate is one of the a rare Mediterranean climate. Uh, they have a year round growing season. So I began working at this little nursery and this gal decided she didn't want to do it any longer and I took it over and I have to say that my that's where I learned the Latin, the language of uh, horticulture and the, gen the gentleman that had the wholesale nurseries because it was primarily plantsmen that were the growers were so generous and so kind and they were really my teachers so i had a hands-on um training with the men that were doing the growing in that area and one nice thing about gardeners nobody judges what level you're at they're just happy to share information and knowledge and that's one of the beautiful aspects of being in the gardening world people are always willing to share and so I guess that was where my love came from as, as time went on um, to just be able to share that information with people, especially when I heard so many people complaining that they wanted to uh, know more about gardening. I could see there was a need for it. So, uh, so, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you know, what's, what do you have to lose? There's no, I guess there's some competitive nature in the gardening world when it comes to nurseries and such, but spreading this knowledge, it just helps the planet, helps humanity. There's, it makes a lot of sense to have a community that is all about sharing because, you know, the, uh, the flip side is losing the knowledge and then folks not understanding how to work with mother nature and, you know, turning to chemicals and other things that um, will be detrimental to the planet and not help these other gardeners. So that makes a lot of sense. When you were in the Carpinteria area, were these gardeners all into organic permaculture type stuff? Or did you find that a lot of them were using chemicals or what was kind of the, the overall nature of gardening um, in the nursery world back then? Well, at, what had happened, and I think to understand the world of horticulture, after the uh, World War II, post-World War II America, the chemicals came into play um, pretty rapidly into our life and into our world. And when being in the health field with my husband and because we were really for lack of a better word purists about eating organically um providing good food to our children everything when i got was plunged into the nursery industry i was i was leading the area santa barbara county in i would only sell organic fertilizers uh pesticides fungicides I started that very early on in the nursery industry because I could see that the chemicals, like anything, will throw Mother Nature out of balance. And when she's thrown out of balance, then she becomes unhealthy. She's trying to always right herself, just like the human body. Um, it, it's, it's the same relationship. Um, yeah. The nursery industry plants as with us with the earth and the most basic relationship and the oldest relationship is the human body with plant life and mother nature provides everything that we need i mean there is no lack in in what she does for us for medicine and uh, 
food and so forth, but mankind has tampered with that. And now in this, in the world that we live in today, we're seeing either extremes in the, we're living the extremes of chemicals and damage done. And then there's a tremendous, in terms of permaculture, there is a tremendous global, and it's global, uh, backlash for people to repair the, the earth. And that gives me hope because a gardener will always uh, know that mother nature, she'll, she'll take care of it eventually. You know, she'll always, she will thrive. And so in terms of permaculture, because it is a system that basically repairs the land and repairs it very quickly, um, mm -hmm. just by observation, seeing what grows naturally, uh, you know, creating mulch and compost and organic uh, using um, vermiculture, the, the worms, just using mother nature, you can repair uh, land that's been damaged, even with, with chemicals, within a few years. Wow. And yeah. um, it's, I, I li really love that part of it. Yeah, and I want to get into that more. Um, going back to the chemicals uh, kind of uh, eruption after World War II with companies like Dow and, you know, these petrochemical companies pushing this on uh, the average homeowner, you know, you see it with lawn care, and with weed killing, of yes. course, with the glyphos glyphosate, mm -hmm. um, with good old Roundup, which you still see stacked in massive uh, display cases at any um, you know general uh, hardware store or tar you know any um, place where you're going to find gardening supplies. There's the Roundup. Um, it's it's interesting how it kind of in the same way uh, nurseries relate to plants, you know, doctors relate to their patients, how it's this constant being whored out to chemical, you know, chemical companies, uh, whoring them out uh, and pushing this stuff. Um, it's fascinating to see that parallel there. And um, those brave people like yourself, who I'm sure, you know, back in the 90s or 80s, you had probably a lot of people wondering at your nursery, hey, where is the Roundup? Where is this stuff? How am I going to kill these weeds? Um, and that's another topic I'd love to get into because I even see that around our neighborhood with some of our neighbors who aren't so enlightened. And this is just kind of, and I even have family members who actually work uh, in the nursery world who uh, use Roundup. And I would love to go into some alternatives to that and how we as people who want to help the planet can educate those in a very positive way and help them not only understand that, you know, the dangers of the nasty chemicals, but also um, the benefits uh, and alternatives uh, of using something that's more natural to control things like weeds uh, and other, um, you know, unattractive elements in the garden that these chemicals were developed to get rid of. Um, so in your, in, to kind of circle back um, to, to the permaculture aspect, and I really do want to get more into um, some specifics like mushrooms, for instance, which I'm, I'm super passionate about and using uh, mushrooms to clean out, um, to leach out, you know, or clean chemical weight, chemical spills, et cetera. Um, but going back to um, the nursery aspect, and you mentioned organic pesticides and such, are there alternatives to Roundup that are out there on the market or, you know, what's a, what's in your mind is a good way to control weeds that doesn't involve chemicals like that? Well, there's now um, in the year 2000, the nursery industry began to go organic. So yes, now we've got, we have lots of choices, which is fantastic. Permaculture as a system is one way to um, heal it uh, without even having to go into that arena. Uh, but just to go, just to back up just for a minute, the one, re the one thing that stuck with me in 1979, I was pregnant with my first uh, son and I, my husband bought me a book by a naturopathic physician from Europe and in it, and I hadn't given birth yet, and I wanted to, um, you know, breastfeed my son. 
And I remember reading what really triggered and, and steered us into the holistic part of, and, and nothing but organic, is that I read that if, if I ate food with pesticides, that that pesticide would become concentrated in the breast milk and I would be passing that on to my child. Yummy. Well, that was the biggest, most alarming thing that I could ever read that I would be passing on pesticides to my son. Because as um, earlier on before I, I went into the health field with my husband, I used to teach um, swimming and I taught at a swim center in Palo Alto where there were, for every 50 minutes, there were different types of <clears throat> special needs, disabilities that people were coming in with. And the water was the only environment that they could physically move around in comfortably. But a lot of them were suffering. I had autism. I had all these different, um, well, we don't use the word handicapped now, but all these physical challenges. And I so wanted a healthy child. And so that was that single piece of information about not giving my child pesticides <clears throat> changed the course of everything for both my husband and myself. Now he'd gone into medicine, but, and this is before he was, he's multi-degreed in medicine. But at that point, that was the, that was the single biggest, um, again, piece of information that steered our course into the world of health and um, knowing that we needed to eat organically. And so again, when I went into the nursery industry, there was no way I was going to deviate and go back into the chemical world. And I knew that mother nature has all the answers herself. You just have to work with her, but we've been busy imposing our will using chemicals, throwing everything out of balance. And now we live with a lot of that at this time. Um, but there's, there's incredible pioneers in the world of gardening. Um, ripping those lawns out and um, placing it with edible landscaping. So instead of, you can have a little bit of lawn, but why not throw a fruit tree in the middle of it? Or, you know, take out some of that. Uh, they were big on plastic and um, ground cover underneath soil or rock and smothering the earth. Uh, that was a big one for the, the dads of the 50s and 60s. And of course, the lawn was everything. It was how good does your lawn look? You know, they were judging each other by how green was their lawn. So we're pulling out of that it, now. I hate to say it, but I don't think that is just 50s and 60s. I was just back east in upstate New York. And um, I, I was joking around. It's just so lush out there. I must say, God, I, I envy their lushness, their the amount of precipitation they get there. Living up here in a much more rocky soil with um, much right. more arid climate, especially in the summer here, you know, we get dumped on in the Pacific North. We're in the lower Pacific Northwest, so we get dumped on all winter, but come... Uh, May, June, it dries out through September and everything's brown right. and, uh, and you go out there and it's just green. Um, but I joke around that, yeah, it's still the whole lawn competition and you got everyone on their sit on mowers and literally <laughs> right. when they finish, they got to turn around and start all over again with acres and acres of lawn. And just imagine, just imagine um, if they were implementing some sort of, um, and a lot of people do have gardens out there, of course, but imagine some, as you were saying, natural kind of food forest development where um, they're, you know, not having to, in, you know, spend hours and hours and hours mowing their lawn. Um, but that is a really interesting point you made, too, about the, the plastics on the ground cover to control weeds, I guess. And I assume those plastics are leaching into the soil besides suffocating, uh, you know, the topsoil. I would assume they're kind of leaching um, toxins into the ground as well, no? And yes, but, and more than that, when uh, I did research on worms, which are mother nature's, boy, they are just our, can be our savior. Um, Go worms. The, when the, 
yes, the worms, and that's a whole nother, we won't get into worms today, but that's a whole nother subject. Uh, the power of the worm, the mighty worm. Uh, when it gets, the ground temperature gets over 85 degrees, then it uh, begins to kill the worms underneath because it's too hot for them. Oh. So, or else they're going way, way low below where that they're, because there's nothing for them at the surface to eat or, you know, to do what they do, which is to make an incredible product. The worm castings are one of the most powerful healing tools that you can put into your garden or give, administer to your plants. Um, but it was, uh, and I'm actually on this property, I am doing that as well. The gentleman that owned the land before us and that's one of the reasons I see why I'm here. <clears throat> My husband and I have picked up and pulled out of the ground miles of, uh, well, let's just say hundreds of feet of plastic. And that was one of the first jobs that we did was to get rid of plastic. Yeah. And, um, um, that's the earth to breathe again. And that's something I've seen in person up there. Um, and with all the plastic being ripped out. And in fact, you kind of have a great case study for the land that you've inherited because of um, the way it was treated before with the chemicals, the plastics, and um, also certain things that were planted there, like the bamboo that you guys have had to deal with. And this is some stuff we can go into. Um, uh, real quick, back to the worms, though. I, you introduced me to worm castings, and that's something that has become a great friend of mine in my garden. Um, and I know you mentioned before developing a worm farm where you create your own castings. I've had a few people ask me this, what exactly are the castings? Um, and if you wanted to create your own worm farm, how would you go about doing that? A little bit of a tangent here, but this is something I've been asked by multiple people. Get started uh, with just a little home. Um, they're a box, and they're on the you know you can purchase them at a lot of different places to just take some of your kitchen scraps, and they've got these boxes, these home units that you can um, utilize and create your own worm castings. You don't have to have a worm farm, and vermiculture is a a huge topic in and of itself. But bottom line is for worms, the byproduct of the what of, of a worm going through and creating the castings, they can take anything even toxic and it comes out this pure, beautiful, it was, it's black gold is basically what it is. Uh, there's a gentleman down in Sonoma County. I was reading about him. He was using worms. Um, he bought a worm farm and he then in, expanded it. And then because he's surrounded by vineyards, he began to go to the vineyards and, you know, sell them on using worm castings mm -hmm. <clears throat> for their newly planted, transplanted starts. Well, they reduced the loss of those starts from 20% loss of brand new starts to a 1% loss, wow. which is huge. And if you are doing some landscaping and, or you've got some plants in distress, you can tell packing the top or digging worm castings in is just one of the greatest tools that you can do for your garden. Wow. You know, we're, it's like a little bit of an advanced technique, uh, but it is uh, just to plug the worm. I love the worms. Could I say one thing about the worm casting just from my personal experience? Uh, sure, please. Uh, and a question I have is I noticed the worm castings, and maybe it's the kind I'm getting or whatnot, but they seem to clump um, a lot. And is there a, a strategy for, and is, can that become an issue, especially in container planting um with the clumping uh is that just am i getting old worm castings or is that something that kind of happens and you just have to be judicious with how you break that up or um what's your experience with that well i've only done it in on a large scale so tell me again what your boxes what's going on in your boxes uh, I'm finding that the worm castings tend to clump up and can often uh, deter what proper drainage uh, through oh, okay. containers. So um, I was just curious mm -hmm. if there is maybe I'm putting too much in or, you know, and this is something, these are some more practical tips, but how do you go about applying? Well, this could be great just going into overall soil prep and soil health because this right. is like, you know, one of the numero uno right. 
topics of being a gardener um, and knowing your all that stuff with the soil health and Dr. Lando has kind of got into a little bit about that. He's teased that how you guys do that. But um, yeah, I just have found that sometimes I deal with clumping with the worm castings. Right. Probably just a little bit too thick. I would dig it in, in and around the plants and in and around your beds where you're going to put, if you're going to do transplants, dig it in there when you're putting in uh, transplanting starts. Or if you have beds that you're going to do a mass planting, then just just dig it in and let it come in because every time you water this incredible new, these incredible nutrients are released, but yes, I'd break them up and just add them to the, the soil. Now I want to say one thing about uh, living up here uh, where we are on the Smith river. <clears throat> Part of the reason that we moved here is that we're in one of the last untouched pristine environments, as you know, Mike, in California and one of the cleanest rivers in California, not even I would at this point say probably America. We still have fish that run up the river. You can still, uh, you know, it's virtually untouched. There's nothing that comes into the Smith River um, up above us that is doing any kind of damage. Yeah, it's, so, the only, it's the only undammed river in California. And thanks to folks like the Smith River Alliance, shout out, and uh, folks like Barefoot Brad here in our town, um, who are continually fighting against um, uh, mining operations trying to come in above the above the waterway, um, maintaining um, a natural order on the river. Uh, I agree, it's definitely top three or four cleanest, most pure rivers in all of Northern America, or at least in the United States. Canada has got some pristine. And We've we've been very blessed because the um, our signature crop, the jagulon that we grow, um, as a testimony to the health of the soil here, which that crop is usually grown in a semi-tropical environment, has just um, it it it's an incredible plant that grows and loves this forest and the mulch that we have underneath these trees. Because again, we're in a we're on some land that is just really just pristine and um untouched uh yeah. truly so that gives you a, that gives us a little jump start and yeah that's a, a good note for folks out there is if you can you know one of the greatest things you can do for yourself this day and age one of the best investments for you and your family is to find a place and i know it's not easy for people just to get up and move out of the city or whatnot but something we always kind of push is and why we moved from LA up here is in this day and age, if you can get out and get to a place that is um, more in touch with nature, it'll, it'll just pay heavy dividends for you and your family and your life. Um, but for those that can't do that, um, we can talk about today how permaculture and uh, these other gardening tips can still help you clean up your land where you are, um, even in the heart of the city, have the ability to create a container garden on your deck or in your kitchen window um, and have the ability to still create an environment for yourself that will help you live a healthier, more vital life. Um, Absolutely. And I'd say that um, permaculture, uh, especially, and I'm going to bring my husband in on this, um, is the, uh, it is so far reaching right now <clears throat> And there's, it's offered everywhere. So even if it, you're at home in an urban environment or in a city, there's some, some techniques that you can do just to feel like you're part of a, a balance and to become aware. And even a little backyard uh, can become a little balanced sanctuary and a place of retreat and um, peace that uh, in a hurried life and in a city life, you can still have an essence of feeling the connection because to me that's what gardening is about gardening is the feeling connected connected to life connected to spirit connected to um just this incredible beautiful planet we've been gifted with and we owe it to be responsible stewards and you can do it in a city and i don't really want i i never want, i encourage people no matter even if it's a balcony, like you mentioned, Mike, you can still have a little oasis and you can create that for yourself. And there's some great tools these days, vertical gardening, uh, um, 
all kinds of wonderful garden uh, tools and um, for the urban home. You can, you can do that at your house. I would actually stress in a way that it's almost more important for those living in a city to do this than people out in the country because it's kind of a, a, you know, a given if you live out in the country to have a, a garden. Uh, and you know, you're already surrounded by a, a lot of mother nature, but those living in the city, uh, that's the revolution we need. And it goes beyond just even, uh, um, those, you know, living in high rises, but companies, uh, embracing it, uh, obviously the, c- the cities themselves, um, with their civic responsibility, uh, developing ways to have uh, living roofs, for example, uh, and bringing uh, gardens, uh, you know, this is something we talk about, Bear and I have talked about many times on this show, is that the, the nature of cities should be amazing places to go visit with, you know, hanging gardens everywhere and, and lush environments you walk through with with um, parks and, and all that. We were just uh, up north uh, camping up in the Cascades and went down to Bend, Oregon uh, for an afternoon and we're hanging out in this amazing park that runs through the city where the they shoot river uh, winds through and people laying under weeping willows and swinging in trees and uh, you know and this was in this is a kind of I would say a large town or a, a micro city if you will but it's um, it was a wonderful environment and we can have that everywhere so yeah um, maybe there's a, a, a way that we can kind of go through a checklist of people who want to look into getting into this. I know it can be kind of daunting for some folks to to start uh, investing the time and also the money. You know, there is a money investment coming in to starting your own garden and then seeing it all die or whatnot. It can be uh, in times very um, dissuading from uh, maintaining it. Um, So maybe there's a way that we can kind of go into a checklist to get started and embracing permaculture even in an urban environment so that you can ensure that your garden uh, thrives and that uh, you can find this uh, inner peace, if you will, from uh, creating this environment for yourself. Deb, what are some ways to get going in on this that you would recommend right off the bat if, let's say, you are living in a suburban or urban environment and want to get your garden going? And I know this can be kind of can go lots of different places depending on one where you are in the world, uh, two, uh, what kind of setup you have, what square footage you have, are you inside, are you outside, et cetera. But maybe there's some general things we could throw out there just to start to help folks um, kind of zero in on starting a garden where they live. Well, I would direct everybody. There's a woman named Rosalind Creasy, who is, uh, she and her husband are well-traveled. And um, she noticed when they were living abroad that uh, she lives in Palo Alto area now, but she, um, she noticed when she was living abroad that people did, in other countries did not isolate their vegetable garden to one location in the backyard like American gardens tend to do. You've got the lawn in the front and the garden in the back and they don't merge. There's no interaction. Mm -hmm. So Rosalind has written several books on edible landscaping. And when I began to do design work, um, I thought, uh, boy, I just ran across edible landscape. It came into my mind myself instead of say, um, you know, you you have a pathway and you want to um, create a, you know, just a border for that pathway. Well, strawberries are a great border mm. plant. So then when I read Rosalind's book, I actually got a hold of her because I had done some, uh, I wrote an article about edible landscaping, actually a couple and asked her if it was okay to quote her and, and you know what she'd done. And she speaks all over. She's great. But she talked about the fact that, you know, some people just say rip your lawn up. Well, I like a little green grass myself, but how about carving it out and putting in, Um, you know, fruit trees and bushes and things that produce food 
and not just it's all into the backyard. So I would begin looking at, I would get definitely get a hold of Rosalind's books, the edible landscaping books. She's written several and there's other people as well, but she really brought it to the forefront. And um, start looking at your yard or your area with different eyes. And that's the main thing, to see it differently, to look at those squares and rectangles and figure out where you can <clears throat> perhaps carve out circles and ovals and, you know, move with the rhythm of your yard and soften it and bring in food because you can have food year round. Many people can. And again, it doesn't have to just be in one small area. Raised beds are also a great choice. Maybe you don't have a lot of land or you physically you're um, incapable. You know, it's hard to get up and down on the ground. Well, raised beds are wonderful. And it's a great choice for being able to have a garden, do succession planting, which means that you begin a crop and then two to three weeks later, you begin another crop right on its heels. So you have this succession of food. It's not all harvested at, at one time. Um, so you've got food ongoing. And it's easier on the body and you can maintain it um, without feeling overwhelmed. And there is just so much information out there. I actually, in a way, I, I'm not sure where to begin, but sure. uh, just beginning to look at your yard and your land with different eyes. That's the main thing. And then there's a world of information and people are welcome to get a hold of me if they want. And I will be happy to answer any questions or where to direct them to find something that might help them with a problem or if they, they can even email me photos. Um, and I would be happy to help someone if they want to make some changes in their garden. That's fantastic. And uh, as we develop the new site that's focused more on the agricultural aspect of uh, the AV gardens, we'll make sure to have uh, on our resources page uh, a ton of these books and links for the, those who want to educate themselves more as well as a contact for Deb, currently, if you do want to contact Deb, you can just go to alphavedic.com and use our general contact. We'll make sure that she gets that. And that's wonderful for you to offer that. Um, going back to looking at your, your overall landscape, your garden, or excuse me, your home, your apartment, and looking into the flow of that, I think that's wonderful. And one tool that I know I've used mm -hmm. is sketching out, actually sketching out a map of your your layout and then kind of then designing your garden. And there's actually great software for that now and all sorts of tools that you can use. Um, and I would assume there's maybe even like permaculture software that you can plug in your coordinates where you live and it'll start to t factor in all the conditions of your environment. Um, I don't know if you know if any of that exists out there, Deb, but um, there's all sorts of cool ways you can get into sketching out um, your plan, right, for implementing this uh, into uh, your property. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand this over to my husband, who is, um, we've been, he's been drawing out uh, the map as we continue working um, of our property and some of the changes, but he is um, really, he could give some information about permaculture that I think would be valuable to the people listening. Oh, great. Oh yeah. We know bear. <laughs> hey, sir. Um, uh, good to see you. Um, let me get closer here. Yeah. Welcome. Okay? Welcome to this wonderful conversation. It's been already very educational for me. Uh, what you're going into as you're listening here, you know, for me, learning how to kind of sketch out how to engage permaculture onto my property, what are, where, what would you recommend and what have you learned about this? Uh, Deb and I make a good team. She's always been my mentor in, in everything about gardening. And uh, I was more schooled in uh, the clinical use of herbs and herbal medicine, that sort of thing. And uh, with permaculture, my training is more about the actual design as far as laying things out so that uh, from the very start when you're planning your garden, even if it's a simple backyard garden versus uh, even a small farm, then you have a, a game plan because invariably down the road, you're going to wish that you did 
And you're going to say, oh, shoot, I wish I would have thought that out a little better as far as the layout of my water supply and ease of uh, accessing, you know, from one point to another and, and, and not making necessary work for yourself or making things impossible. So uh, I wasn't listening entirely. So in the context of your conversation, uh, what exactly were you, were you getting at with uh, introducing permaculture into this? Yeah, I, we were talking about converting you know, your property to an enriched, enriching uh, you know, garden and using permaculture for that. And I was saying as far as designing that out, as you just mentioned, having a game plan is crucial. So we were kind of going to the steps of doing this. And I said, first and foremost, mapping out your actual property and starting to come up with uh, specific strategies for creating this environment in a way that will be, uh, you know, one, um, captivating and, and fun for you, but two, also effective in that um, it will be something that you can easily maintain and that works well with uh, the uh, a place you live with the climate, etc. And I was saying maybe there, you know, besides hand sketching this out, I don't know if there's software now that works on a more permaculture basis where you put in your coordinates where you live and it factors in all of that and, you know, all the other environmental variables, etc. Do you know of software that does that or how do you go about it? You just do this, uh, sketch it out yourself and just know from what you've been trained. I'm just trying to help people kind of get a start on this. Okay. Gotcha. So what I was alluding to initially was just the infrastructure, uh, the layout. So it's intelligently planned. <clears throat> Logistics are good to ease your work, get water to where you need it and so forth. But the next part of permaculture is to create a sustainable growing situation. And that's where a little bit of uh, botanical knowledge comes, becomes handy. There is software for the architecture of the design itself, but that I would say for the average gardener is, is more, um, more time consuming and, and maybe something you don't even want to get into. So for the average backyard gardener, what you want to understand is, all right, uh, well, let me give you an example. Uh, we grow, as, as I think was already mentioned, we grow a lot of things, but one particular herb that we focus on uh, because we grow it in great, great quantities is our Jaugulon or, or Gynostema. And it's a plant that likes a forest canopy, but it also likes the warmth that it's used to where it grows in, in Southeast Asia. And here we are in the Northwest. Uh, we have very cold winters where everything goes dormant, where it doesn't over there. But fortunately, uh, this plant and a lot of tropical plants actually are very hardy once you get to know them. So they can survive winters if you mulch over them properly to protect them from winter freezes and everything. And then they just come up as any perennials do in the springtime. But in the case of, uh, say, this vine or any other plant, say you're in your backyard, you want to grow peas, but maybe you have complete exposure to the sun and those more shade-craving crops uh, aren't going to thrive well. So what you do is you copy what nature does. And in permaculture, we call them plant guilds. And that's like a little plant hood or neighborhood, if you want to call it that. And you'll notice in nature that everything is coexisting perfectly where you have the larger trees that provide the canopy for those kinds of plants that don't want to direct, have direct sun. And then the, and then the, um, uh, you know, the shade craving ones are, are just growing naturally below them. And then below them, you have all sorts of other things. So nature just tends to organize itself in a fashion where each plant contributes to the welfare of the whole. You can create your own plant guilds in your backyard by, say, planting a fruit tree, uh, maybe over some planting beds that you know over the next couple of years you're going to want to grow broccoli and, and uh, pea vines and things that don't like direct sun. 
uh, but then they will be able to thrive under the canopy of a tree. Uh, certain herbs, culinary herbs, can also be grown under the same canopy around the base of the tree while the tree as it matures and gets uh, a larger span, then that will provide uh, ample shade for the surrounding uh, planting beds and so forth. So you want to know, first of all, what you want to grow. You want to know the characteristics. And what's great is we have a lot of knowledge based on just a lot of years at doing this. And between Deb and myself, we uh, usually can cover our bases. But when you're in the world of gardening and botany, your education never stops. Uh, I'm in ongoing herbology classes and, and keeping up with new uh, cutting edge levels of distillation. And, and you know, as technology improves, uh, then you can adapt uh, things to make your old world things, uh, old world training uh, even improve. So it's a constant process. And that's the fun thing about uh, gardening is that you can go in as deep as you want. Uh, even in a home garden, you can grow aromatic herbs and that sort of thing. And then uh, very easily within your kitchen, have little distillation kits, make your own essential oils, and you can take it as far as you want. But it's not only uh, great for your body, and there are a lot of studies now that show that gardeners live uh, very much more health, healthy and have fewer health maladies. And uh, it's greatly suspected that gardeners live longer just because you are outside earthing all the time, you know, staying grounded to the earth instead of uh, behind the computer and getting your frequency scrambled with microwaves, just being outside in the earth, growing things, being part of a, uh, of a, a growth process, a nurturing process. It's, it's good for your body. It's good for your soul. So um, if you want to grow something, all you have to do is go on to the internet and do a simple search and you'll find ample articles about any plant you're interested in. It will tell you the exact uh, conditions that those plants need. And part of permaculture then would be to say, okay, how can I create that in my backyard or wherever you're at in conditions that may not be favorable to what I want to grow, but over a one, two, three year period, how can I create the exact conditions where everything's going to thrive? So permaculture is really not just about sustainability, but to have a situation where things coexist and mutually benefit. And that's the way nature works. So that's the way we should work things ourselves. We always mimic nature. There's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new to create. Uh, the greatest minds uh, are empiricists, which is a true definition of science. And that means you spend a lot of time observing nature and then you copy what nature does. Permaculture is the science of observing and copying and then adapting it to your own needs. And also in a way that in the long run, you're not utilizing a lot of resources and things that contribute to a lot of the problems we have on the, on the planet. And you'll have very good uh, nutritional food, uh, landscaping even that's very aesthetically pleasant that is self-sustainable and um, you don't have to be a slave to your garden at the same time. Yeah. And I think this is going to be a topic that is impossible to cover in one show. Something we'll have as a recurring topic moving forward, of course, something we're all super passionate about. And to your remark about letting nature have its way uh, it's funny, we were just up in the Cascades this weekend, or this last week here, uh, and going on some amazing hikes and noticing that at some of these forests we're in had this natural get ground cover that was gorgeous, and actually took pictures of it because we have a similar climate where we live, and uh, it was just like, wow, it looked like it, we were in a manicured uh, forest, and it was just a natural ground cover that was just thriving everywhere, and it was just, it was amazing. So it's like, hey, let's figure out yeah. what that is and mimic that in our yard because 
Um, what we inherited with the property we purchased, we still have places full of plastic covered area with colored, you know, wood chips covering. And that's something we want to eventually get out pretty quickly here and get uh, growing more food probably with it. But um, to your point, yeah, um, what were you doing? I was just out there walking in a forest and just, uh, you know, just looking at everything and seeing what nature was doing and then taking notes. So that's a great point. Um, to the point about permaculture, do you have any other books that you would recommend uh, people could look into to get as a good introduction to permaculture? I know uh, Rudolf Steiner, of course, with biodynamic farming uh, relates to this. Uh, any other resources that you would recommend, Bear? A great resource is actually Oregon State University, where I did my permaculture certification, has online videos, and they even have a lot of them reposted on YouTube. So I imagine with a simple search, going on to the Oregon State University agricultural site, you can find it there. And uh, all those are free to the public. Uh, a lot of them that are part of the coursework aren't, but it would be what are available are ample resources to get people started. Um, okay. That would be now they're more of a institutionalized permaculture, which is good because you get more of the architectural, uh, you know, ability to lay out a site. Uh, there's a lot of good information there. And also just the basics as far as the concepts that were originally created uh, by the Australians who, who uh, 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 you know, originally coined the term permaculture and uh, then spread it to the rest of the world. So the, the basic concepts, the philosophy, it's all there and it's all for free. And I think these days most people do better with videos. So um, take advantage of those. There's that other whole level that I like to get into, which is um, more Rudolf Steiner oriented and biodynamics. And that would suit the temperament of other, you know, certain people who want to dive deeper into plant energetics and understand how the entire cosmos is reflected, not only into our entire bodies, but into the plant kingdom and how we have a, uh, uh, a symbiotic relationship with the plant world. The plant world is uh, the mirror image of, of the human body and all of its processes and all the cells within the botanical world and different plant species are mirror analogs of human cells. And when you understand how uh, this interweaving uh, natural process works you realize there is no separation between the parts ourselves and the ecosystem these days there's a great tendency for humans to be demonized you know because we look around and we say wow we've screwed things up well that's really not the average person that's just certain corporate interests who have done things at the expense of the planet and the rest of us and most of us follow along just out of ignorance and as far as not knowing there's any other options. But um, if anybody, any, the vast majority of people, I would suggest, would not go along with that if they just had more information and knew they could do things differently. So instead of saying humans are bad, what we really have to uh, appreciate is that humans are nature you know um, animals are nature plants are nature and we're all one um, intelligence network uh, and no part of that natural order is inherently evil that's just something that we're being sold now and that's another whole different discussion so um, yeah uh, yeah, when you get into the Steiner biodynamics, uh, Schauberger, all the, the early naturalists, uh, the people in uh, areas of technology, your Tessas, your Walter Russells, uh, where they explain the physics behind everything, you, you have all this proven to you that 
No, we are intended to be the stewards of the natural order. We are an inseparable part of it. And it's just time for us to be responsible. And to be responsible, we have to educate ourselves. And the best place to educate yourself is to create your own personal laboratory in your backyard. Uh, figure out what you want to do, something that's going to enhance your health, your lifestyle. Uh, uh, reduce your food budget even, and, and then do a little bit of easy research, uh, watch some videos, and you're really going to have a great time. And I'll tell you, it's, it's really contagious because once you get a little bit involved and you stop looking at gardening as work and, and you, know, you might have to go out there and dig a few holes and move them, some things around, but just that activity is better than anything you can do in a gym because you're, you're moving, you're bending, you're, you're doing all sorts of things. You know, I've always been an exercise buff and did it for sports, but I can be in great shape in the gym. Uh, but then if I haven't been outside actually doing manual work for a while, it's a whole different activity and gets your body in many different ways. So uh, and then once you just get your body accustomed to this, it's not work anymore. It's an absolute uh, something that you crave and, and usually you can't stop once you start. <laughs> yeah, I think a good strategy is to do a little bit every day too and get into the mode where you get into a typical routine, morning time before it's too hot, if it's the summer or whatnot, and go out. That's a, a, an amazing way to obviously keep your weeds down too and everything. But just have a practice, you know, just like anything else that you need to develop is having a practice. And that was, an, you know, an amazing point there is just go out and start doing it. Um, the best way to learn is, just, as you said, start your own little laboratory in the back and uh, off to the races you go. One point about permaculture that I think could be extremely advantageous to folks in, in more um, populated areas is using it to help with... Um, detoxing their environment as Deb brought up on a number of points by uh, through using worms and other plant life. One thing that we know it's on the horizon is the whole 5G uh, aspect that's coming down the pipeline. And I know from my uh, bit of research that 5G is, uh, is a short waveform that can't penetrate dense matter. So building up uh, you know, agricultural walls or excuse me, uh, you know, plant walls, et cetera, around your property and doing that to protect yourself sounds like a pretty good strategy. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, it's a great strategy. Uh, we love it up here in the Northwest because we're surrounded by forest and an abundance of water, just natural springs, lakes, rivers. So, uh, you know, moisture also helps dampen the effect of 5G and uh, even if you're in a suburban setting, uh, the more trees you can plant around you and then also make it an edible landscape so it's practical at the same time, uh, yeah, it, it would do a, a great amount to lessen the effects of 5G. Yeah, I think also to your point, as stewards of the land, and I talk a lot about this on a show about the breakaway civilization is actually us, it's people like that are watching this right now, that are interested, that have joined our community, that are educating themselves. It's up to us to not depend on these corporate entities, the state, et cetera, to help us out, but just to take, take, take it upon ourselves to make the change. And, and what better way than just to go out and transform your own property uh, to not only provide uh, additional food, to relieve your need to um, rely on uh, mat big ag and going to the market, but also by cleansing the environment because we know the more trees there are, uh, et cetera, the more um, that uh, certain toxins and stuff in the air is taken out. Uh, so, you know, by doing that, uh, each and each one of us is helping change the world. I truly believe that. And so everyone should be their own gardener in some way. Uh, Deb, back to you. Um, as we start to wrap this up and we're going to have you on again and again, I think it'd be great to have you on as a regular guest 
because this is such a huge topic and there's, you know, we could dive into shows just on, as you said, worms or soil health, um, things to improve your soil. I know Bear, you're pretty active uh, with um, doing soil design and uh, different uh, experiments with soil. Um, but as we just kind of encapsulate this first show about um, developing your green thumb, are there any other notes, Deb, that you'd like to drop in here as far as how people can, um, you know, develop their green thumb more so that um, they're setting themselves up for success in their garden uh, right off the bat? Yes, to answer that. No matter where you live, one, of, one thing that has become apparent is that the natural world, and when I say that, I'm talking about the pollinators, which we definitely need them. And there's so many of them from bees to bumblebees to even some wasps, flies, moths. There's a myriad of uh, pollinators in our natural world. And if you go, if you're going to make some changes in your yard, I would suggest finding a nursery that sells native plants, native to your area, to your state. Uh, go back to the original blueprint, if you will, because the native plants provide a habitat um, to those pollinators and you want them in your yard. They're important. And that begins part of that uh, cycle of um, sustainability is to draw those um, helpers into your landscape and into your yard and pull out if there's something that uh, has been, let's say you've purchased a home that's been landscaped before, but you're not happy with it. <clears throat> definitely find a, a, a nursery that sells those kinds of plants that are more for your environment because we've been shipping plants everywhere all over the world for a long time, but they don't necessarily belong and some of them should not, you'd be better off to have things that um, are good for your climate and not necessarily having come from another part of the world or another part of the nation. And that's one thing I would really encourage people to look for are native plants. Oh, wow. Wonderful. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, we ourselves are dealing with purchasing a property here that had a ton of um, plants from elsewhere and are slowly making that change ourselves. Um, any other points here, guys, as we start to wrap this up? Um, any ideas as far as, uh, you know, from your, excuse me, your own personal experience or from um, just what you learned at, uh, at your coursework there with permaculture as far as detoxifying the environment. I just think that's a really cool subject. Uh, any specific plants that uh, you guys know about that's uh, good for that in regards to air pollution or soil health, uh, increasing soil health, uh, any other little techniques we can throw out there to help folks, and then we'll start to wrap this up. Well, my after just finishing up a series of the seed to supper program with um, beginner gardeners and some people that had no experience at all, I'd say, don't be in a rush and understand this. We all kill things. So if you've killed something, don't get discouraged. It's um, mother nature is very forgiving and she will, she's a great teacher and um, be kind to yourself. Don't be afraid to explore uh, ask questions. There are so many videos out there now as, uh, that you can educate yourself. Um, just the main thing is don't be afraid to try. Uh, the earth needs all the gardeners it can get right now. Hands in the soil. And if you are living in an urban environment, I found this when I with my first nursery down in Southern California, I would often have... Um, people that were in the health field, uh, doctors, nurses, um, you know, psychologists, they would just come and walk through my nursery during lunchtime. <clears throat> I, at that time I had six fountains running and a pond and it was re I really set it up as a more natural environment. And I found that it was the great, um, 
a great place of peace for many people. So the balance for you, if you do have a busy life and you've got an urban environment, is to create a sanctuary for yourself and for your family. The kids, as of, in terms of children, uh, kids are crazy about gardening. It's, in, it, it's easy with them and they love to help. So don't be afraid to try it. And um, again, there's just so much information available that uh, you can have fun with it and it can be a great family adventure as well. Wonderful. I think that's a great way to throw a capstone on today's discussion. Uh, it was wonderful having you today, Deb, on the show. We look forward to having you back. Um, like I said, I think we can just keep going and going and going on this. So um, let's make this a regular uh, thing, you know, ideally once a month if possible. And we can have other guests on as well that can um, – that are more specialists in certain areas. For instance, we did a mushrooms workshop uh, on um, at Alpha Vedic Gardens a few months back, and I would love to um, bring him on. Um, I'm blanking on his name right now, um, but uh, to dive into the power of mushrooms and how uh, he did a whole presentation on how they're using that to clean up chemical spills and do all sorts of amazing things naturally using the power of the mushroom. So um, I would love to, to dive more into topics like that. Um, we've got a great guest next week, and I'm sure we'll uh, cover some of that uh, as well in regards to um, uh, more agricultural-based topics. Uh, and that I'm really looking forward to, to that guest as well. Her name's Mano. I always say her wrong her na last name wrong. Is it Pretri Bear? Um, and she's going to be a fantastic. She's fine with the English pronunciation of pre-tree, although um, I've known her for many years and I still can't pronounce it the way it's supposed to be pronounced. It sounds something like prek. <laughs> I just don't have the, 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 the pronunciation. But anyway, uh, yeah, she just uh, goes by mono uh, pre-tree and she's also known in professional circles as uh, Grace. Uh, she's a great workshop leader, and, and we'll let you introduce her next time. The only other thing I would add to finish off today is that this is such a huge uh, topic that we'll go on with many, many podcasts in the future. And one of my areas of specialty is soil science from a standpoint of what we call ionization analysis. And just like we do when we're assessing the body, we understand that biochemistry is important to understand, but biochemistry is actually the byproduct or after effects of electrical forces. So when you treat the body with a deep appreciation for those electrical forces, which can be tested by way of the biochemistry, then you can uh, operate more upstream and have more effectual change, better and quicker results. The same thing in the soil. When I look at the soil, I look at its electrical properties by way of the biochemistry. And rather than just trying to add, uh, add certain chemicals to the soil, like we do even in organic gardening, what I'm really doing is uh, adjusting with chemistry the micronage, the resistance levels of the soil to make the soil compatible with the plants in that area so that things are not only more efficient as far as growing, but also the plants are healthier. There's greater nutrition in the plants and you need a lot less of uh, input from fertilization and all that, uh, you know, just the adjunctives that you would uh, rely on more on just straight organic gardening and that would be the ultimate of permaculture because now you're not even relying on the fertilizer industry albeit organic let alone the the frankenstein stuff going on out there and um so we'll we'll delve a lot into that and the the the, the last thing i'll say is those principles actually explain more the esoteric writings and studies of somebody like Rudolf Steiner, 
where he's talking about planetary influences and uh, planting uh, astrologically. And well, now all of a sudden we have the physics that explains exactly what he was talking about. And it's no longer in the realm of woo woo. This is actually advanced science and, and we can do things better than ever now. Yeah, that's going to be a really fun podcast. I can't wait to do that one uh, and really kind of dive deeper into how you are using these different techniques with the soil and the energetics. And of course, as a fan of Rudolf Steiner myself, I I really love talking about that stuff. So really looking forward to that. Uh, if you enjoyed this talk today uh, and if you've been following us on the live stream Please don't hesitate to hit the like button that helps others discover our show. Please subscribe. Uh, we will be replaying this on our YouTube channel, which uh, is every Thursday at 5 p.m. So you can subscribe to that as well. We live stream this on a new platform called DLive, which we're on right now. You can join us at DLive, that's letter D L I V E dot TV forward slash Alpha Vedic. Please subscribe. You can actually earn some crypto on there that can be easily transferred out to money. So we are trying to push these new technologies. Um, you can also join us on Telegram, which is our day-to-day -day online community. It's the one we really focused on. It's a great app. You can throw right on your phone and jump in the conversation. And that's just, uh, you can join us at t.me forward slash Alpha Vedic, A-L-F-A-V-E-D-I-C. And finally, uh, this discussion will be in a podcast form that you can download or stream on your phone. Currently, we are on Podbean and uh, shortly hope to be on iTunes and uh, Google Podcasts and everywhere else you can find podcasts. You can find all of this information on our website, alphavedic.com, A-L-F-A-V-E-D-I-C.com. Please join our mailing list. To get updates on for, uh, future shows as well as discounts on the products we offer. Thanks so much for joining us today, Deborah Lando. It's been a great pleasure having you on the show. I look forward to having you on again shortly as well as coming up and um, of course love coming up to the gardens and every time I go up there I feel like I learn something new. Um, I guess the thing we can take from today is get out there, get out in your garden every day if you can. Um, just start doing it if you're not doing it already. Um, even if you're, as we said, you know, 40 years gardening, um, the education never ends. And I think that's a, a valid point to take from today. Thanks, guys, for joining us today. We look forward to the next show. Appreciate it. Have a good one.